Hello everyone and welcome to the IFA Archive Open House. As many of you know, IFA or India Foundation for the Arts is an organization that supports and implements projects in arts and culture across the country. We are a nationwide independent organization and we have been making these projects in various kinds of arts disciplines across the country, across regions and languages possible since 1995. To give you a sense of numbers, over the last 26 years, we have made possible about 750 projects with a commitment of rupees 34 crores to the field. When we turned 20, there was this discussion about what special thing should we do turning 20. Should we have a huge party? Should there be a festival of the arts? Should we invite all our grantees and project coordinators from across the country to come to Bangalore and uh, share in the festivities? But we realized that given that the resources are very limited in the arts, we did not want to do something where we would land up spending a lot of money and the shelf life of that event or the memory of that particular happening will be short-lived. Instead, we said, could we uh, give something to the field and to ourselves that will have a much longer lasting value? And that's how the idea for the IFA archive came about. And I must tell you, we knew nothing about what an archive was. We thought it was just like, you know, boxes of material. Uh, it took us a lot of learning, studying, talking to experts to understand that boxes of material are just that, boxes of material. To, for it to become a useful archive, there's a lot more thought process methods that need to be put in. And so our journey started and in 2018 in October, the archive was launched. And the idea was that this is going to be a physical and a digital archive. So we have the physical archive in Bangalore and the digital archive is online. And, and you must realize that these projects that have come over the years have a lot of very interesting material, audio, video, images, texts, documents of different kinds. And it requires a lot of time to actually um, make them archive friendly, accessible and put them out. So right now, if you go to our online archive, you might find about uh, half of these. So 350 to 400 of these projects and their deliverables, their materials available. And uh, I will now, before I actually invite my colleague, the archivist of IFA, Pishwati Chakraborty, to tell you about what is special about the IFA archive open house and what we are going to be doing today. Uh, a few house rules for those who are attending. Uh, there is a chat box where you can put your comments, your suggestions uh, for, the, for the work that you'll be hearing about. And in the Q&A box, if you have any questions, because our speaker today is going to be available to take questions at the end of uh, the presentation, you can put in your questions there. For those who are listening to us on Zoom, you're here, but those who are listening to us on Facebook live stream, if you have questions, please put it in the comment section there. And we have somebody from IP who's going to bring that to our notice and we'll be able to respond. So with that, this is the second IFA Archive Open House, and we are delighted. I'll not tell you who the guest is today because I leave that to my colleague, uh, our archivist, Vishadeep. Vishadeep, over to you. Thank you, Arundhati, and good evening, everyone. As the archivist at IFA, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the IFA Archive Open House, focusing on conversations around the archival materials we have in our vast repository. Throughout these sessions, we hope to be able to share some of these materials with all of you in all their complexities and diversities, and hope they will inspire many of you to visit our archives. Furthermore, we hope that uh, these sessions will address questions and concerns that arts and culture archives raise, and adding new arguments and ideas to the whole discussion. Although originally this session was planned as a conversation between Mangai and another IFA grantee, Makran Sate, but Makran could not make it due to some inconveniences. So for today's session, we have with us A. Mangai. Mangai is a scholar and theater practitioner who has actively engaged in Tamil theater as an actor, director, and playwright for almost three decades now. She has written, directed, and performed in various plays throughout India, 
As a scholar, she has written on Tamil Treta, Treta history, cultural history, and a range of other subjects. She received a grant from IFA under the Arts Research Program in 2017 to write a critical history of early 20th century Tamil Treta using the writings of Pamal Samada Mudalia. Mangai will first uh, present her work, and then Orunduti and I will join her in a conversation. We will take the audience questions at the very end of the session. Now, without further ado, I'd request a Mangai to please take the stage. Good evening. It's, um, I've waited long enough to really share this work. And um, I think I'm kind of in the middle of it. So there's going to be a beginning and wherever we are now and uh, what else is expected uh, of this. So I'm going to kind of have two parts of it. One would be the research project that I was engaged in on Pamal. And uh, it, it's going to be new for people who are not familiar with the history of Tamil data. So I'm just going to take you through some of that and the kind of I think thoughts that really opened up when we started working um, on Pamal. Uh, so for the first time, we do have IFA holding some of the texts of Pamal, but there are many that are available, but not in a shape that, that's yet to travel. So I'll begin the presentation. So may I request the PowerPoint to be shared? So I'm just calling this presentation Making Archive Inclusive. So we'll come to the discussion, I'm sure, soon enough. Yeah. I just have a few uh, images for you to take in before I really begin. Yeah. The first one. Uh, so on to your left is Pamal. On to your right is Sankrada Swamigal. The two of them literally reigned over the late 19th century and early 20th century Tamil theater. Uh, Pamal is called the father of early modern Tamil theater. Sakrada Swamigal still reigns supreme with uh, about 18 plays that have been collected, whereas Pamal has about 97 plays that are published and available. Yeah. We also have other people who have contributed whose names don't figure in when we are talking about early Tamil, uh, modern Tamil data. The one on your left is called Kandasami Mudaliyar. Uh, and I think one of the innovations that he did was to convert novels, which were equally new in any la Indian language, I think, and in Tamil as well, to con make the novels um, adapt, adapt, he adapted the novels to stage. So we still have the name novels uh, for stage performances, especially in the northern part of uh, Tamil Nadu. The other one on your right is Kanaya Naidu, who is primarily uh, a person who acted and ran a company and was supposed to be extremely rich and a devotee of Krishna. And apparently, when he donned the role of Krishna, he wore actual gold and diamonds and everything uh, as jewelry. So he was that rich. Yeah. I have these sketches which are taken from Theodore Baskaran's book, The Message Bearers, which is now available in Tamil translated by me. So I took it only for the one with the turban and he is Krishna Sami Pavala. And he apparently took a play on Kadar, on the use of Kadi to London on the invite of the queen. And then to our, the bottom two, the left one is called Baskaradas, who was primarily a songwriter. So he wrote these songs for various plays and everything. And uh, we have one of our modern theater practitioners, Muruga Bhubadi, who is a great grandson of uh, Baskaradas, who has edited Baskaradas' diaries. And they are available. But he has just put them together in a chronological order. We are yet to really read it. Uh, critically. Of course, the other one is Kandasame Mudalia, who you already saw in the previous clip. Yeah. I'm trying to introduce Balamani Ammar, and we don't have the, the first one, as you can see, is a studio image. 
The other one is Ravi Verma's painting of Balam Niyamal. Um, and the one that you have, Balamani, the theater uh, uh, actress, was a Higginbotham's postcard that was sold. You know, and uh, she probably used this image for advertisement, advertising her own place. I've just brought out an article on Balamani Amar because he, she lived around the same time, probably from the Dasi community, even though there's very less comments about uh, her Dasi life. But we do have, uh, it's an article in EPW, the most recent EPW, and I would like to introduce her as part of the uh, people who, who were pioneers in early modern committee. Yeah. Now I just put them in some chronological order. So you have Swamigal Paradimar Kalenjar, whose given name was Surya Narayana Shastri. I've put all the caste markers in brackets, um, but still I think they are relevant and they are relevant to know what kind of people will enter into which section. Now, Paradimar Kalenjar wrote scripts and also about the history of Tamil drama. He did not directly participate in any performances. He also wrote about Natya Shastra. And then you have Kumbagonam Balamani Amal, whose birth and death year, I have, I have not been able to uh, pinpoint and clearly say that that is it. So I put a question mark there. And she also did not write any scripts. You also have Kanaya, Kanaya Naidu, who was primarily a performer and ran a sabha. Balamani Amal also ran the first all-female company uh, in Tamil Nadu, about 70 of them, and fed them, got them married if they wanted to do. So she literally seemed to have uh, done in her own way some way to kind of provide a livelihood for people who otherwise would have had to lead a not an impoverished life or a Dasi life. And you have Pamal Samandam, who is a prolific writer uh, and therefore becomes important from the point of view of the archive. And then you have Kandasami Mudaliyar and Krishnasami Pavala. Um, yeah, Kandasami Mudaliyar too. He dies a bit young, but he's 1874 born. Yeah. Next. Uh, I also thought that we should put in, I mean, the, this is not yet there in IFA archive, but many drama notices are available in uh, Roja Mataya library. And based on that, um, I wrote an article along with Arasu, uh, my partner and professor of Tamil, called Assuring Changes, Constructing the History of Tamil Theatre During Colonial Times Through Drama Notices. In the book published by OUP called Playhouse of Power, edited by Lata Singh. So what we were really trying to see is how to really write the theater history through these very ephemeral kind of thing. There are stories and stories of how notices are distributed. This is the oldest that I can find. And it actually says um, there is a separate space for women. So the others are not supposed to enter that or create any trouble uh, during the performance, even if you are a husband. And then, so you're not supposed to sit. And the last line also says that there is no space provided for the Dalits. This is 1892 that we are uh, talking about. And there are many other drama notices which are available, at least about 40 to 50 of them in Roja Mateya, which can be salvaged today and um, not yet, um, not yet uh, digitized in that sense, but they are, they are available for us. Now I move on to Pamal per se, and these are some of the copies of Pamal that we have. We actually have a whole set of about 60 plays of Pamal. These are the better lot that could actually withstand the courier or the travel to Bangalore, and they are available at IFA archive. Some of them are available with me, but I can't lift them by my hand. So they are they're really in a brittle state. As you can see, the titles are given sometimes in both languages, but otherwise in English as well. And in English, he just says Pamal Yam Samandam, but in Tamil, he says Samandam Odaliyar. Um, I also want to show another. The first page of his plays, yeah, 
the next slide, where he, of course, the dedications are there, and uh, it is to his parents and the friend that he refers to there, which I'll be coming back to, Rangavadivelu, was a name, was probably the only female impersonator with whom Samandam had acted, Pamal had acted. And he has, he writes a lot about him, which I think are an amazing material for us to really work on um, the way female impersonation worked in Tamil. Now, in the other section, in the Mugavurai or preface, he says, you cannot produce this play. It comes under copyright law. So you need to really kind of get permission from me if you're going to be performing. But he's well aware that the theater community doesn't follow any copyright laws. But he was a lawyer and then soon became a judge and was awarded the Sir title. So he was uh, very much aware of the copyright law. And he mentions that in every play that he publishes. Yeah. Now, what is really, really important is about uh, almost close to a thousand uh, pages long, uh, six volume books, which he called Nadaga Mede in over 40 years before the footlights, which was a primary text that I really relied on, you know, to write the critical uh, or begin to write the critical history of Tamil. Now, originally, they were published in six volumes in different years, as I have put down. And the collected volume was published in 1998 by International Institute of Tamil Studies. Uh, and then off late, a fellow researcher and also a theater colleague called Dr. Payani is publishing the place. He has published uh, six volumes two of them having part one and part two of all Pamal's plates. So they're all available uh, available now. Um, I mean, it's, it's a humongous task and um, uh, one would really like a lot more additional information when these publications come, but they are now available in a form that you can hold in our hand. And Pioneer is also trying to reprint and publish many of the other texts of Pamal, including uh, various things, including talkies, the early talkies, the films that started coming. Yeah. These are some of the other texts. So there is a theater autobiography or memoir, as he calls it, which was published way back in the 1930s. And then his actual autobiography is published in 1963, which is a very, very slim volume and doesn't really enter into the dramatic thing because he just says, I have written that, so you can refer to that. And there are history of theater, theater theory from Natya Shastra, uh, Chilapadigaram, Tamil sources, and early plays that were uh, available before he came into the theater. And his own critique of what he calls as professional theater company, which is uh, people who make a living out of it. And his own groups will be the amateur companies because they're all middle-class employed, educated people who were participating in theater out of a passion for it. And he also refers to fellow artists. In fact, he has a full length book on Nanfanda Kalingal, the artists whom I know, and they talk about it. And he has two books on early talkies. And he himself has um, attempted to coach the actors for the early talkies. He goes to Calcutta, stays at the studio, and stays there along with the people who create the scenography and the set and everything, and trains the actors for it. And for the first time, training the actual female artists who are going to be performing in the films. And then he also writes a lot of Stala Puranas. He has books on food uh, that is good for your health and also medicine like home remedies and Siddha medicine and other things, all his interests. Now that is the uh, crux of the whole problem, uh, crux of his um, volume of work that we are talking about. Now, the, what we get to know from his work is that, that he refers to people from uh, other states. He himself was influenced by Bellari Krishnamacharlu, who is also referred to as Dharmavaram Ramakrishna Charlu in um, the volume collected by K.V. Akshara uh, in Karnataka. 
and uh, his name also is found in the Telugu theatre history. So probably mm, he was somebody who was working in both Andhra and Karnataka, and his plays seem to have travelled to Chennai and to other parts of Tamil Nadu. Now there are other people who are also referring to uh, plays that have travelled to Tamil Nadu, of which we only get it like a reportage or a memoir from other sources like journals or newspaper articles and stuff. So you have somebody who who is who who has been performing before Kamal exactly like him, who gave up his government job and formed his own troupe. And he refers to a Marathi drama troupe from Sangli. And, uh, and then he forms his own theatre group called Manamohana Nataka Company. And then you also have Veer um, Raghavatasar, who was not connected to Chennai, but who, who is from the uh, Trichy Pudukote regime, which is like the middle part of uh, Tamil Nadu, and he talks about Parsi companies visiting Trichy and Pudukote. In fact, Kalyana Ramayar, who, uh, who is supposed to have talked to fellow artists because uh, he's much older and you have people who knew him who are referring to what he used to say about the groups from Pune, Kolapu, Changli, Sangli and Jankandi. Now, uh, unless, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'm missing Makran today, because I'm sure he will really add his input about how these companies travel. So in a way, a history of Tamil theatre cannot be conducted in Tamil Nadu alone. So we need to really kind of, uh, have, it's a group affair, but we need to really share information from Karnataka, uh, at least Karnataka, Andhra and Marathi for sure. You know, and but we also have references to a few Bengali scripts that seem to have traveled, but not necessarily Bengali groups. Yeah. Now, added to it, we also have the South and Southeast Asian Connect. Now, Sankarada Swami himself was, he learned Tamil in Sri Lanka under a teacher in Colombo. And he had composed songs when he traveled from Colombo to Tudukurin, which must have been on the ship or a boat at that point. Um, we also have Kamal who is talking, and he's from the middle class, uh, consisting of many upper caste people. So he talks uh, very humorously about families which were not allowing uh, the upper caste people to cross the ocean. Then you lose your caste identity. And then they had to convince and do some kind of rituals to overcome the sin that they are committing by crossing the river. But in Sri Lanka, he actually quotes from journalistic uh, reviews from Sri Lanka. You know, so you know that uh, there were people who were uh, watching it and also commenting on um, on the groups. And then you have Madras dramatic crew true, which consisted mainly of Brahmins and educated Brahmins, and uh, they had traveled to Burma. And you have Pioneer Pachetiar Company, which, uh, which was formed in uh, Colombo, and we have references to them talking about groups from Tamil Nadu. And you have Kanaya Naidu, who traveled to Malaysia and Singapore. We also know that Balamani Amal had traveled to Burma and people there used that Ravi Burma painting to advertise for her place. Yeah. Now, uh, within Tamil Nadu, uh, Pamal himself has been part of uh, conferences that were organized by the theater artists. So it seems to be an initiative taken by the artists themselves, but hugely supported by uh, the rulers and the growing political powers. For example, in the 1944 conference in Erode, you have Rajaji, who was a chief minister at that time, and you also have another who is the leader of the uh, DMK, attending that conference and speaking about it. And it happens in Erode, which is the seat of Periyar. You know, so you, you know that the political forces and many people working in different fora were interested in the artists coming together. And uh, so we do have the souvenir that was published in the 1944, 45 conference, we don't have any data, only a reference to it in the 46 uh, sovereign, the souvenir that they published. And you do have centenary volumes 
and Silver Jubilee souvenir of the State Sangeet Natak Academy brought out. Uh, so the last two actually contains a lot of musicians and dancers as well, along with uh, data people, which I think are very, very important documents that we need to talk about. Yeah. So these are the two uh, covers of the conference souvenirs, 44 in Hero, the first one, and 46. And the 46 conference, let's go to the next slide, is dedicated to Pamal. And it actually says Pamal is somebody who really brought in uh, status to the performers. Otherwise, they were Kutadis, very derisively talked about as Kutadis. But then he is Rao Bahadur, uh, father of Tamil theater, and they are dedicating the volume to him. Uh, so we, we do have that. Now, there are also other aspects that can come out of archiving these materials. And um, I mean, in the report, report that I submitted to IFA, I do focus on the female impersonation. Those of you who are familiar with female impersonation, especially during the Parsitator time, know that we have at least four life stories um, uh, in Hindi, translated by Catherine Henson, who is one of the major researchers. Uh, the actor talking about uh, their own life, Jai Shankar Sundari from Gujarat, and you and we also had Anuradha Kapoor, who made a play all based on that autobiography. But in Tamil, we have this Rangavadi Velu, who shares 28 years of stage life with Pamal uh, on and off stage. And they seem to have grown really fond of each other, very, very dependent. We can't really connect it to anything homoerotic, but then it was a bonding that was really, really very close. And Pamal goes on and on when he publishes his um, theater memo, or he talks about it. And you have a photograph of Rangavadi Vil performing as Desdemona in As You Like It, which is uh, Tamil Nadu's Sundari, if we can talk about it. Uh, and he dies early. But then Tamil Nadu also has male impersonators, uh, because we know, including Balamani Amal in 1922, when she performs uh, to collect money after Sankrita Swamita's death, she performed the male role. And uh, we have one of the uh, famous authors in his memoir, P.K. Shanmugam, referring to her as being old, and therefore she did not do the Dasi role, but she did the Jamindar's role in the play called Dambachari uh, Vilasam, which was written in the 1840s, um, which is supposed to be ushering in social dramas. And this is a picture that I managed to get of K.B. Sundarambar, who later joined the Congress and became the voice, the nightingale, so to speak, of Tamil Congress. Yeah. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is to just kind of leave it at that. I, like I said, it's somewhere in the middle. It's not the beginning or the end, but somewhere in the middle. Now, because Pamal wrote in Tamil, and you have a very, very brief section translated uh, for Sahitya, uh, Sahitya Academy's journal, Sangeet Natak Academy's journal, Sangeet Natak, which is included in the recent volume on, um, uh, you know, generally uh, texts from various languages compiled by uh, Aparna Darvatka. And that's all you have in English, apart from whatever I have submitted to IFA, uh, which is a pending thing. But you don't, uh, so therefore, Pamal doesn't come within our view of constructing the history of Indian, we'll put it in quotes, Indian theatre. Now, the next question will be, okay, Pamal wrote, but there are so many others that I have mentioned here in this presentation who did not write. But there are references to him, there are anecdotal references, there are memories of them, and there are drama notices where we find their name. So there are very, very scant material or transmitted mostly orally or, you know, uh, people have recorded that. Now, what we do is, at least for Pamal, we have the written sources. So on the one hand, because he wrote in Tamil, it did not get into the major mainstream research. And the other thing is, there are many who did not write at all. 
And even if we collect the data, I think we give preference to the scripts rather than the performances because it is very, very difficult to present an embodied documentation. You know, at a time when you hardly had even photographs, including Sankrada Swamigal, there is one photograph of him sitting and that was taken after his death. So I'm just going to kind of leave you with these questions. And I know IFA has had projects which are connecting to that. I myself have been engaged in the arts project of uh, Freedom Begum as a director. You know, but before that, I, I mean, I would really request Arunati to pitch in. Yeah, how to make the archive come alive. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Pangai. That was fascinating to actually, uh, you know, go through. We've read the reports you've given us, but to actually see this presentation and see how, how important these materials are. And, you know, there are two things that, uh, that are very important for archives, other than the work that actually goes in and the question about where they are, how they are, how they are accessible. One is that how do you make them come alive? How do you uh, put the breath of life into them? And here I want to give two quick examples. One is there uh, in the 1960s, there was this terrible linguistic riots that happened in Assam. And Himangu Vishash, who was uh, one of the people who started the IPTA movement, he was a scholar, musician, he activist, he and Bhupen Hazarika created a kind of Bengali Assamese combined peace mission. It was a cultural peace mission that went into Assam, traveled across the area, talked to people, sang songs in both languages in trying to bring uh, the people speaking in these two languages together. It was one of, I think in India, one of the finest examples of how a cultural intervention in a very volatile political space happened in time. And many years, uh, so I'll share um, a couple of images from uh, that time, uh, just here. Um, yeah. So here you will see, these are some of the images from that time. Rongili Biswas, who is the daughter of Emango Biswas and is herself a scholar and a musician, Want, had this huge archive at home. This was Himango Bishash's archives. And as a, she wanted to approach it, not just as a scholar, but also as a practicing musician. And there are three very interesting things she did. One was she retraced the path of the mission, the roadmap of the mission, met some of the people who, were, who had witnessed the peace mission during that time through Assam, and it was almost walking in step with the archive. So the, mater the materials were in the archive and she was doing the walk again. The second thing she did is she documented talking to a lot of people and their recollections, anecdotes, stories of what they remember, what happened at that time, did it have an impact or not? And as we know with stories and memories, they are reconstructed, but that's fine. She created a beautiful film of this walk and meeting people. And the third most interesting thing was that she sang the archive. So she brought back instruments of that time, the way it was sung in search for what, was, what were these songs at that time and what did they mean? So there was a CD of compositions that she uh, recreated from the archive. So we found it a very interesting way of how do you make an archive come alive? The second one is an is an example from Hyderabad, the Kalakriti archives in Hyderabad. They have over, I think, five, 600 maps. They're called the MUN maps, N-U-N-N. -N. So in 1908, uh, the Nizam of Hyderabad had asked the engineer, uh, Leonard MUN, to create these maps of the city. And these maps are there in this archive. So two uh, fellows, Sama Blue and Sirisha Indupuri, they got fellowships to sort of bring this archive alive. And they did this by actually walking the maps. So they, they not only studied the maps and how cartography actually um, created the image, created the urban space of Hyderabad, but looked at the relationship individuals have with experiencing these maps by actually walking. So they created these really interesting walks for children from school, from interested parties, 
to actually uh, explore the maps by doing the walk themselves. Wow. This, wow. The, this is this is very interesting because you know the way you were talking about it also it was about uh, how what are the different things that you do to bring an archive alive or where there is not an archive how do you get an archive in place the second thing I want to point to and this a lot of people like yourself know uh, funding money is required to save things to preserve things no matter what we say we require funding and I want to take this opportunity to thank the Indorama Charitable Trust because from day one, when IFA was dreaming about the archive, they came on board, Arti Lohia, who runs the uh, trust. She saw the value in not just IFA's projects, but if these projects were to have any afterlife, we had to keep it in one place so that future people can use it, scholars, artists. So, and it's been, you know, that's the other thing. You have to have the stamina to support archives. It's long drawn. It's not instant noodles. It takes time. And she's been with us since day, day zero, actually. And so a big, big thank you to Indrama Charitable Trust for uh, continuing to support this archival intervention. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I mean, I just want to come in here, uh, Arundhati, to... Uh, really talk about an arts project that you supported uh, for Rahi. And um, Rahi is a Bangalore-based um, organization uh, working with uh, primarily uh, trans men, women, uh, and intersex and queer people. And I've had uh, contact with uh, both Rumi Harish and Sunil for close to 20 years and had already worked with them on the few plates. But that was like, you know, how we would call us communicators. So you go collect the stories probably from among the cast and we used to produce it. But I think in 2017, when they started collecting material with Radhika as part of the TIS uh, research project, Radhika was at TIS studying and she was doing this research and Rumi and Sunil had helped them to collect data about what in Bangalore stands as a uh, Behamahal bus stop. And, uh, and then the kind of histories and you know the inclusivity uh, that existed in that place, which of course is erased now. So, I mean, we don't even have a place to rebuild now. You know, so something else has taken over that space, but then they had all these stories and memories. And when they had this material, and I met them in 2017, I think, and uh, they were sharing it. And then they said, we don't know what to do because we don't even have a single photograph of the person who actually made all this possible, the beggar. We don't know who she is. But then there are many people who had seen and experienced the hospitality of the place, right from a rickshaw puller to a sex worker to, you know, uh, petty uh, uh, shop owners and stuff. And she had actually allowed them to kind of live around that area. And, uh, you know, once we started the project, everyone from Bangalore kept on feeding us with stories after stories. Um, but from the point of view of queer history, I think that was really, really amazing that an inclusive space is possible. But then, since we don't have anything as a document, as something that is tangible, what do we really do? So theoretically, um, I think I'm drawing from Diana Taylor, who makes a distinction between the archive and the repertoire, which I would strongly recommend for anybody. And uh, I mean, she talks about Mexico and a lot of performances. So basically, she's talking about repertoire as an embodied archive. You know, something like uh, revival, but in this case, we couldn't revive anything because we couldn't show the Begum uh, alive for us. But then we tried to kind of produce the um, ephemeral, uh, intangible knowledge and experience, uh, or in a way, the knowledge of the feeling, if there is a word for that, of uh, being inclusive in a space, you know, just to kind of see it as something that existed and therefore can exist. And today, I think in this bulldozer regime, I really think 
it is important to revive those kind of stories what i want to do is to just share a very very short clip from the play and for those theater people who are here i'm choosing the script is by rumi harish based on all the interviews that they had collected and it is about seven languages i think uh, but i'm choosing the section where the director can actually add or intervene into that uh, narrative that is given to us uh, twice removed thrice removed uh, by the script via the interviews and the plays that we have uh, got now yeah we'll play the video
she thought she was Queen Victoria. Fat and round. Hey! Hey! She used to like to dress up like that statue in. Yeah, we'll stop there. Um, I just uh, wanted to have that section because um, uh, all of us are familiar with subtext and you can build a subtext in whatever way you want. And here we were, we were trying to really kind of build the subtext um, in a way which will actually, there is an interview and already you know he is dodging questions. Um, but then you're also making the narrator or the narration centered on the chorus, which belongs to the queer people. And so they actually do an interventionist reading. I'm just going to end there and say, I think uh, it is important that archives come alive and they should come alive either to recreate or, but then it is important to be critical about archive. You know, so it is a critical intervention of the archive, which I think will make it vibrant. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Looking forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you so much, Mangai. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you so much for this such an engaging uh, presentation and enriching us actually. Uh, so yeah, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, after listening to your presentation, I mean, this uh, this particular question popped up from the from your first part of the presentation that while writing the critical history of early twentieth century Tamil theater. What would you say were the most challenging aspects of your project from the archival perspective per se? Uh, the archival pers perspective, I think just to lay hands on the material. For example, I think I have um, talked about it in my report to IFA. Uh, Pamal had uh, run an English journal, um, hopefully in 1895. You know, I mean, but we don't know. And I still haven't been able to access uh, the journal section of the archive in Chennai. And we don't know whether it will be there. Uh, probably it will be there in London somewhere. You know, I'm sure the colonialists have had it. So, but I'm still waiting to see. But what he does is he refers to that. He says, uh, he refers to a review that came in that journal of course, without giving us the date. And he also says that he wrote down in pencil uh, in all his notes. So even the script, apparently, he wrote in pencil first because he keeps making changes. And he says he's trying to write this theater memoir based on the uh, notes. Now, where are the notes? We don't know. You know, we don't have um, anything that is handwritten by Kamal. You know, because that family is scattered, we are not able to get in, get hold of any family members. That whole building is gone. But we do have his sabha was named Suguna Vilasa Sabha, which is now run like a club. Hmm. You know, nothing to do with the arts, but it is just a club for playing cards and indoor games and other things. So I think these were the challenges. You know, I mean, how do you really? break through this, you know, it's not, it's hardly, it's not yet 100 years old. But still, we are having problems accessing uh, these materials. Plus, of course, cross-checking. Because he clearly says, I'm writing what I know. You know, like about Kumbhakon and Balamani Amma, he writes two paragraphs. You know, whereas there, there are these other stories. So, I, I mean, for me, I think the dilemma was to whether to take him as a as his writing as a Bible and just believe everything that he said and go by that, or to kind of counter read it with the other anecdotal memoirs and stuff, which are not believable, but I would really love to read it against the grain. I think that was the major challenge. Right. Uh, so, uh, talking about your challenges, I mean, the next question that comes to my mind is, I mean, we, we are enriched by your material in the IFA archive. So what kind of use do you see for your own materials that are there in the IFA archive? Who could be accessing and using this? Uh, would it be only for the scholars or artists as well? 
Right now, I would be happy even if the scholars use it. <laughs> yeah, because the plays are all A, quite dated in, in the style in which it is written. Um, except one play which was done by a modern theater group called Kutupat Rai here, you know, which is a kind of a pa parody of uh, Harish Chandra. It's called Chandra Hari, you know, which was produced as a spoof, as a, as a humorous piece. Nothing to do with Pamal's theater style, but just the text. So I think just to access the text and see if you can read and stuff. And also translations, people who are interested in translation. Because you have like at least 14 to 14, 15 Shakespeare texts translated by uh, but free translation. You know, I'm also an English teacher, so I won't I won't say it is verbatim translation, but he kind of adapts it. So I right now I think it's a scholarly people, you know, but he has a lot of details to give us about makeup about the scene sets of that time, about uh, music, and then about uh, what he calls as, you know, our caste party. He calls it pagoda meeting, you know, so they just have pagoda and pakora. So he calls it pagoda meeting. And then also previews. So when you're ready for the show, they have an invited show. Right. Now, all those things for me, I think as a practitioner, I really think that those are amazing um, details to know, you know, for practitioners. So, but then some researcher has to mediate or some hybrid person like me has to mediate, you know, the performance part as well as the research part should come together. Vishadip, if I may, I have uh, one question that comes right. out of your uh... Uh, question to Mangai actually. Right. Mangai, and you spoke about this. You ended by saying the hybrid person that you are. I was actually going to ask you that you are both a scholar as well as a theater practitioner. Now, both for the way you um, access archival material, um, is, is there an intrinsic difference between how a scholar accesses material and how a research, uh, how a practitioner accesses material? The reason I ask is the IFA archive, most archives are not built for practitioners, actually. It's, it's not thought through. Uh, but the IFA, because we are a practice-based organization, a lot of our work is in practice. Uh, we have to constantly think about how can we facilitate the use, both for scholars who, who know how to use archives, who are trained into how to use archives, and have a certain way in using archives, which also may be the uh, constraining them. On the other hand, artists or practitioners come with more open, et cetera, but then don't have the training. So do you, for yourself, do you access archives differently when you're thinking as a scholar and thinking as a practitioner? That's a difficult question because I still don't know when you approach things as practitioner and when you do it as a researcher. One of the reasons I go back and forth with Pamal is that, mm. you know, because I, I guess if I was a trained, I am a trained researcher, but not in performance studies. Right. So I'm more into literature, which is already self-consciously created. Mm. But then Pamal doesn't write like that. Mm. So he goes back and forth, you know, and there are cross references. So I think, uh, I think I do approach it differently. Mm. I mean, now I have no, all my notes in pencil mm. in the margin. If I look through it, I think I'll know that which are the sections which I'm using to read about the performance and which I use for the script, script or whatever. Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, uh, I mean, as you said that you have approached uh, Pamal's writings in a different way. Now let's come to the Freedom Begum part. So uh, my question here uh, is in Freedom Begum through the metaphor of a house that was open and inviting. How do you see the history of the queer community in Bangalore with specific context uh, to the very lost inclusive public spaces and gentrification? How you approach uh, these, I mean, through Freedom Begum, yeah. I mean, I, I think not just me, the whole team um, really viewed that story as something that will, that will resonate in every part of major cities. 
you know, whether I'm in Chennai or Delhi or Coimbatore. In fact, in Tamil Nadu, we have we have one more play now that directed by uh, Shrijit Sundaram, which is called Nurama Biryani Darbar. Right. So it is about the trans women who make biryani for the past seven generations. And it is taught to them, you know, and then they are performing. So, I mean, I was hoping and I said that now and I will say that today as well. Now, I think I would also stretch it further. It's just not going to be queer anymore. Mm. It's also going to be um, spaces of inclusive um, people with different practices, different eating habits, uh, different stalls. I mean, I know in Bangalore, you do have cosmopolitan areas where you can actually get different kinds of meat and some areas where you don't get. Yeah. You know, so um, it is time that we really realize the difficulties of, um, you know, not having the spaces inclusive. So, yeah. Mangai, there is one uh, comment and question by um, Lakshmi Subramanya. So Lakshmi is here and she says, great talk. I have a question of the archive that Mangai has assembled. And this is to do with aesthetics. We hear of projects that try and track histories of aesthetics in the vernacular and so can think of a consortium of existing work to think more generously about a public history of theater, bringing it to the public domain more overtly. My own experience working with a personal collection of a scholar musician made me realize how valuable archiving initiatives are in restaging public history. Thanks again for this wonderful presentation. So she's thinking of, can we think of a consortium of existing work to think more generously about uh, public history of theater? And I what do you think so. the possibilities of that are? I mean, Lakshmi, Lakshmi, I know her personally and she has been involved in uh, actually bringing many of us together hmm. uh, for a long time now. Uh, so thanks, Lakshmi. I think it has to be done. Otherwise, we are really going to lose rich exchanges. You know, for example, for this particular early Tamil theatre history or early or early theatre, modern theatre history in India, we should actually have multilingual panels, first of all, yeah. and see what are the overlapping names and spaces that, that we get across, and then probably move it to international, at least to include South and Southeast Asia in the case of South India, and I'm sure in Bengal it will be a different history. Yeah. You know, and in Punjab, it's going to be the overlapping Karachi, Lahore uh, belt. So we really need to do that. And I think it's the need of the R for us. Thanks, Mangai. And another uh, comment question. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking, you know, looking at Lakshmi, is that that was the idea of this open house, having Makarans talking about the Marathi theater aspect yeah. and you. Uh, anyway, we'll do it some other time. There's some work that we've had the uh, good fortune to support in uh, Bengal. So we can draw that out and bring it together. Uh, Ramu Ramanathan again uh, has some comments and a question. Uh, Ramu says, Mangayaka, very interesting as usual. My question is, what is the role of journals and pamphlets in theater research? The context is, I ask this because the best insights I got about IPTS policies and activities uh, was from CPI publications like People's War and People's Age as well as in the memoirs of PC Joshi and jottings by the IPTA members. And so I remember reading Bhanu Bharati's Chandrama Singh Urf Chamku, which is inspired yeah. by Luzon's story, the true story of Ahkiu, in one of the back issues. It's through the CPI journals that I learned for the first time about the China theme plays by the IPTA playwrights, such as uh, Roar China, The Flag, Roar China, The Flag, Four Comrades, and uh, one and one did not come back, etc. All this in the 1940s. I thought I should uh, share this theater trivia. Mangayaka, the question I have is, are there similar political journals and pamphlets that you have come across in Tamil Nadu? Yeah, Ramu, actually 1940s is my favorite uh, period as well. Uh, you know, because it's, uh, I have this piece on uh, songs on Bengal famine, um, written in the 40s in uh, Tamil, uh, collecting money for the famine relief fund. I have that article in the Jadavpur Journal. Um, uh, yes, Janashakti, the parties, 
uh, journal and then we don't have much of party pamphlets but we do have announcement of conferences and stuff like that and um, i mean the important thing in tamil nadu is we didn't have a very active ikta mm. but then we had the party and the party leaders themselves including baladandaidam even pr p ramurthy all of them taking roles in place to collect funds for the uh, for the bengal famine relief so that 40s is such a vibrant time and the journals uh, are a really treasure house you know because you do have reviews you have announcements you have names of the people who have participated and then sometimes songs and those songs anyway are collected and some of us learned those songs you know when we were cadres initially in the early 80s we all learned those songs you know i still remember an old comrade called kcs arunachalam um had a fisherman song and then it just says idadu puram padage vidu yele lo ailasa so you go like that you know i mean turn towards the back and turn your horse to the left uh something as simple as that but you know i mean that was really really inspiring and it's not trivia ramu we are really looking forward to having having you share these with with all of us i think it's wonderful thank you yeah uh, so uh, as you said that the importance of the journals and so on so my next question for you is what was your thought behind focusing on the marginalized and explore areas of tamil theater or uh, in or theater in general if you can say now how did you explore that uh, through the journals or through the archives per se how how you got those topics relevant through the archives See, Pamal, I can't call him marginalized. Hmm. If at all, he is the most mainstream. He is Sir Pamal, uh, Rao Bahadur Sir Pamal. You know, and lived a really long life. Has given all awards, including Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan, and everything. Uh, so he was not marginalized. But uh, but then he had this amazing material. But then once you start reading him. and uh, he is also presenting to us that tug of war between uh, the sabha theater the sabhas various companies that were formed and they were performing probably the puranic plays yeah so our people who taught us theater in tamil nadu very e- easily said okay chennai and around you had this pamal doing urban theater and then you had the rural people doing sankrada swamigal theater so it was rural and urban i still remember talking to tanvi renaud but my main hypothesis is that you cannot really divide that first of all they had worked together mm. they had exchanged scripts and everything they have critiqued each other also but then they have actually worked together which means you need to really rewrite that history so that you will actually get performers either who are doing full night shows with dance sequence and everything um of course we have an amazing study by susan caesar hmm. based in madurai and working on that but contemporary she worked there in the 1980s and uh, she spoke about them so i wouldn't say it is marginalized but i think reading the mainstream pamal uh first of all you know i'm scared because there's so much material um not really archived but available and uh, but that was a mount mount you know a task I, i i wasn't sure but when you read that you had sources for other materials mm. plus you have all these souvenirs conference relievers drama notices mm. uh, that were already available so drama notice probably will answer your question yes. but i only did one single paper mm. on drama notice i i don't uh, it's at roja mathaya library mm. um i'm sure they will digitize it soon i mean even for them these are all considered to be trivia i'm using the most you know small pamphlets and it doesn't come under the book category according to unesco so therefore they are documenting the books first anything that is 16 plus pages all the rest are there in files you know but uh, they they will soon do it and um, they are getting a lot of support now especially with the state government so i'm hoping 
that once we have those drama notices, then probably it will be different. Manga, it's very interesting that uh, just to listen to you and the various possibilities of things that can come. And uh, I do want to point to a couple of things that are uh, opportunities within, within what even the IFA can offer. As you know, we have another program called the Archives and Museums Program, where we actually engage with specific collections in specific archives and museums, and then open the possibility of project implementation. So artists, scholars, researchers can actually, curators can write to us saying, I want to work with this collection, and this is what I want to do. Unfortunately, what happens is most of the entry or applications that we get are from scholars who are used to working with collections, which is in the archive section, and curators, again, who are used. And you know, we have been talking uh, at nauseum in office about why don't we get poets? Why don't we get playwrights? Why don't we get... And I was just thinking of Sunil's play, Sex, Morality, and Censorship, and how it brought a whole archive of so much alive on stage for like two hours. And so many people I've heard saying, I didn't, they went back to look at Vijay Tendulkar's work because they felt, oh, this is a very exciting part of, uh, yeah. you know, our, our kind of uh, theater heritage, young, young theater makers. Yeah. So I hope more practitioners will uh, will come to take up these opportunities. I hope so. I really hope so. Enough. Yeah. Uh, there is another question. I know uh, this, this is, Again, Lakshmi uh, sharing this, uh, also thinking about your unique status as hybrid practitioner academic, that is, and reflecting on how academic reflection and critical theorizing itself is practice, while theater and cultural practice generates theory and archives of different registers uh, get generated. I therefore feel that we really need to have many more stakeholders on, on board archives. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> Thanks, Lakshmi. Yeah. yeah. Can I just uh, do a quick, because I know we are going to finish, right? Are yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, in, uh, in Tamil, at least very Midras slang, the museum, as you know, which is in um, Igmore, and right next to it is Kanimara Library, and it is this amazing British building. We also have a theater there. And then, but then in common parlance, like a rickshaw puller, for example, and we have it in some of the stories till 60s or so, which I remember reading, calling it Setta College, dead college. Okay. Probably the reason for that was that like within five kilometers right next to the central station was the zoo at that time. Of course. Yeah. So that was a living zoo. And, and this is dead. Setta College. So I think, I think, you know, I mean, it's, I'm just using it as a metaphor and say that the archive shouldn't remain a set the college. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mangai. And I mean, uh, thank you for enriching us, actually. We appreciate you uh, making the evening so captivating for us and for the audience as well. And we enjoyed uh, the whole presentation and discussion. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank everyone who participated and for being a patient audience uh, was uh, made this session fulfilling with the uh, interesting questions. Uh, the IFA archive will be back soon with similar evenings. Uh, but before that, do join us for our next online event, uh, the project showcase, uh, where the project supported by IFA are presented by the project coordinators. Uh, the next project showcase is by KK Ramachandra Pulavar. So do join us on Wednesday, June 29th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, again, thank you, Mangai, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the backing team. That was so smooth. Yes, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Thanks, and see you guys again for uh, the next IFA event. Thank you.